Because the regime is captive to its own lies, it must falsify everything. It falsifies the past, it falsifies the present, and it falsifies the future. It falsifies statistics. It pretends not to possess an omnipotent and unprincipled police apparatus. It pretends to respect human rights. It pretends to persecute no one. Václav Havel že mocenské nástroje strany zůstávají nebo přecházejí do rukou neostalinistů. President Saakashvili awarded this legendary leader of Velvet Revolutions with St. George's Order of Victory for his special merits in his fight for human rights and freedoms, including his strong support for Georgia in the aftermath of the August War. This happened in October 2011 in Prague, where the president of Georgia was invited by Václav Havel. Mikhail Saakashvili is now on trial in his homeland for representation expenses during his presidency. The receipt for a wreath delivered to Václav Havel's funeral is also in the indictment. It was purchased in Prague by the president's personal security guard from the funds allocated for secret representation costs. Here it was purchased. Among such awkward so-called evidence, the indictment also includes the cost of the official visit, during which Saakashvili awarded Havel. I have here 11 letters to different embassies and missions. I want them to learn about the accusations. There have been cases of similar state expenses in their countries, and I want them to pass this on to their governments. In brief, it is to inform the embassies and countries on what is going on in Georgia and that all those accusations are politically motivated. Behind me, there are some suit jackets which you might remember the president wore at different tribunes, at different forums. Both within the country and abroad, the president served to defend the dignity of Georgia. He represented Georgia. To some, it could be merely a court case of suit jackets. To me, it is the case of dignity. January 2010, Tallinn. President Saakashvili bestowed St. George's Order of Victory upon the President of Estonia, Tomas Hendrikivis. On August 12, 2008, he stood among other European leaders in Tbilisi, protecting Georgia's sovereignty. <laughs> At one of the meetings held during the visit, Saakashvili drew attention to Russia's mirror propaganda and pleaded for assistance in fighting it. What astonishes me is how powerful the propaganda machine is of the so-called Western world. This is a tactic that the Nazis turned into an elaborate system. It implies shifting blame for one's own crime to the opponent. We were not present here on the market at all. We set out and established ourselves. Representation expenses related to this official visit to Estonia, including wine and opera tickets purchased at a mall in Tallinn, are also included in the indictment. Vienna. Here, they were bidding goodbye to the eldest representative of the Habsburg dynasty. From the 1990s, from the rostrum of the European Parliament, 
Otto von Habsburg repeatedly expressed his support for the Georgian people fighting for freedom. In 2009, along with Václav Havel and other influential Europeans, Otto von Habsburg signed a most important letter published in The Guardian. Europe must stand up for Georgia. The third president of Georgia attended the funeral ceremony of this great friend of Georgia together with the first lady. Expenses related to this visit, transportation, accommodation, meals, are included in the indictment too. These documents are introduced to the ambassador of Austria in Georgia through this letter. We were struck where we were the strongest, Misha in his field and me in mine. When I invited doctors to the events abroad, as we were starting a new project together, those costs were branded an embezzlement. Misha, who fought corruption, was made out to be the number one corrupt politician. Isn't it absurd? These are the KGB methods. They strike you where you are the strongest. It is the objective of the Russian hybrid war to dismantle the state and the institutions to take personal revenge on those who managed to counter Russia's interests and create a beacon of democracy in the region where Russia wanted to have its sphere of influence. In this overall context, it is quite painful to see how representation expenses of this type or any protocol functions are presented from a political perspective as devastating to the state. I, citizen of Georgia, upon joining the Special State Security Service, solemnly swear, I pledge to unconditionally obey the orders of the commander to stand firmly on guard of the constitutional order of Georgia. A part of the territory of Georgia is occupied by a force that would dare to do anything. You know that after they tried everything against Georgia, what's left to them is the use of a direct political terror and a direct physical retaliation. Therefore, my friends, since here's where the defense line runs, we must stay calm in response to hysteria and hysterical threats. We should stay calm, be cool, but at the same time, we must be vigilant. There were two terrorist attacks against President Shevardnadze. At that time, security officers were killed. During the second attack, during the term of the third president, Russia resorted to a direct aggression, economic embargo, expulsion of Georgians, and finally, the war. Information was regularly coming in on threats to the president. Nonetheless, the state security service was always up to the mark. General Tamaras Janashia has served for 20 years in the Special State Security Service. He was awarded for outstanding military bravery during the terrorist attack against President Shevardnadze. President Saakashvili awarded him with the first degree order of King Vakdang Gorgasali for his devoted service to the state. In 2010, he was appointed head of the Special State Security Service. Ivanishvili's regime threatens him with a jail term of seven to 11 years. Service during Shevardnadze's presidency was relatively easy. There were practically no extreme situations. All the events were planned in advance. Together with Shakashvili, I happened to be underwater, climb Mount Kazbegi, reach the battle front line, 
swim across the sea. I was with him in many different situations. I even took part in flying a plane. Mr. Janashia implemented fundamental changes in the work of the Special Service. The President's armored vehicles, as well as our escort vehicles, were obsolete. The vehicle fleet was completely renewed. A training center was also organized at a high standard. The halls, the classrooms, were completely renovated. So many things were accomplished. This was noticeable in every building, every street. There were so many changes. Every building, every street was a witness to these changes. I assumed they would be grateful for what this man had done for the country and for what Temo had done for the special service. I thought everyone would be mentioning that. I am personally very ashamed that it's not the case. The persecution started immediately following the October 1st, 2012 election. They were looking forward for Misha to leave the presidency. They were doing their best to get in his way. From 2012, our work got very complicated. Everywhere we went, we were confronted by Sonder Commando gangs, groups of inadequate people. Ivanashvili had a hard time understanding why Saakashvili maintained his office when his party had lost the parliamentary elections. He was annoyed by the advice of Georgia's allies to not resort to political revenge, which he was sharply criticized for. In October 2013, the authors of an editorial in the Wall Street Journal mentioned Ivanashvili as a most spiteful winner. We think history will be a kinder judge for Saakashvili. He laid a foundation for democracy in the region where elected leaders often turn into dictators, wrote the influential American publication. What are you wearing on your chest? What is it? I will try to get one for you. What is this? What does it mean? It is a remembrance of our fallen soldiers, a symbol. From the very onset, the main goal of the billionaire who built his fortune in Russia and got promoted by the Kremlin into the Georgian government was to weaken the pro-Western opposition as much as possible and to fully oust Saakashvili from the political life, which could not have been a Georgian dream. In 2003, with the Rose Revolution, Saakashvili entered the political arena of Georgia, the country drowning in corruption. The country had no economy. There were even no roads to drive on. During Mikhail Saakashvili's presidency, in the period from 2003 to 2012, Georgia transformed from a country into a state. On his last day in office, this group of citizens gathered at the residence of the third president of Georgia to express gratitude for all Georgia has achieved under the leadership of Saakashvili and his government. We are grateful to you, Mr. President. It's not a secret that Russia has claims against certain persons. It has claims against our statehood and, in general, against the very fact that we exist as an independent, democratic state. Officially, the Kremlin disguises this. Georgia had different presidents. Gamsa Kurdia, Shevardnadze, Mikhail Saakashvili. None of them was acceptable to Russia, as they admit themselves. And these persons were the main target of the Russian propaganda. Investigation was launched in several directions. They had to attack one of the major achievements as well. A leader famous for his fight against corruption had to be portrayed as corrupt. I have these documents here in front of me. I'm not saying anything without proof. Millions of Georgian lari was inappropriately spent, in particular for overseas trips by the president, members of his family, his friends, as well as for expensive gifts. 
the investigation contested classified expenses incurred to ensure safety of the president himself, his family members, and the guests. Those costs include accommodation, meals, transportation, medical treatment, gifts, etc. From spring 2009, those categories of expenses were classified based on presidential decrees. The Special State Security Service was entrusted with disbursement of those costs. Immediately after Ivanishvili became prime minister, he reassigned the security service to himself. The process was accompanied by a lot of noise, since according to the law, the incumbent head of state could not be left without personal security. Therefore, in the beginning of February 2013, Ivanishvili issued a decree instructing the Special State Security Service to resume its regular functions of protecting the president, including management of classified expenses. Shortly after, Janashia was dismissed. The former head of Ivanishvili's personal security, Anzor Chubinitsa, was appointed to this position. A mission of the counterintelligence department officers was assigned to the Special State Security Service to investigate the classified expenses. In just two hours, the counterintelligence staff reviewed 21,000 files and came up with some findings, which became the basis for an investigation. However, this investigation was not related to the classified nature of the information. It was related to misappropriation and improper expenditure, as stated in the decree of February 26, 2013. The decree was signed by this person. He does not need power because he himself is the source of the moral power of Georgians. He does not need our money because he is wealthier than all Georgians. There's no wall between Bedzina Ivanishvili and the people because Bidzina is the people. He does not need to resort to a tyranny or a heavy fist because his hand is full of power. When we get acquainted with this case, we get an impression that the government first decided to punish certain individuals for something, and only after started looking for those reasons for which they could be punished. As this parliamentarian of the Georgian Dream Party confidently spoke about the embezzlement of millions classified as top secret, the Special State Security Service, now managed by Anzor Chubidnitsa and Bidzina Ivanishvili, continued managing President Saakashvili's classified expenses exactly the way as it was before. When Bidzina Ivanishvili was the Prime Minister, right through the expiration of the president's term and the inauguration of the president-elect, the classified expenses were managed in exactly the same way it was under Tamar Janashia. It was a visit to Turkey. The president broke his arm. As usual, the treatment was covered from these expenses. It was in 2013, during Anzor Chubidnidze's office. According to the relevant order, those included medical expenses, renting armored vehicles, everything as it was before. The documentary evidence related to this episode was critical to the defense of General Janashia. He requested to no avail that the secret expenses of the third president be completely declassified. This was harshly resisted by the prosecutor's office. As to the subsequent period, costs of this type were not only reduced, they were minimized and almost non-existent. Hence, I do not understand what evidence the defense is referring to when they say that the prosecution is hiding some evidence behind a veil of secrecy. The prosecution is not hiding anything. The prosecution was lying that there were almost no secret expenses under Chubidnidze. This continued until the accused general accidentally discovered a secret report that the prosecutor's office mistakenly included in the case file. The document was signed by Anzor Chubidnidze and refers to the payment of 50,000 lari. The discovery of this important material evidence turned out to be a very unpleasant surprise for the prosecutor's office. As long as you have not arrested anyone else and believe that this person did not commit a crime, I too should not be accused for similar actions in an identical situation. Mr. Chubinitsa himself confirmed in a TV interview that he paid exactly the same type of expenses as I did. I have signed various expenses, very large, including the plane and many ordinary expenses. 
It is yet impossible to see the full picture. The Ivanishvili's regime is persecuting the third president of Georgia based on the previous part of the secret representation expenses for which the secrecy has already been lifted. If this classified information is made public, it will become obvious that from the moment Bidzina Ivanishvili came to power, the same, if not more, funds were spent for president's representation expenses. But the difference is that those expenses were not endorsed by Saakashvili, but by the prime minister Ivanishvili and the members of his team. But then it will become apparent that the president's expenses were paid both under Janashia as well as afterwards, following the very same procedure for which Temo Janashia is being prosecuted. The same is probably also happening today as well. However, now it is virtually impossible to prove it, as the prosecutor's office does not declassify those expenses. However, in this criminal case, those old expenses are still contested by the prosecutors. The State Security Service managed secret expenses of President Saakashvili under three different heads of this special service. From the very beginning, the investigation deliberately omitted the period which Anzor Chubidnidze and Bidzina Ivanishvili were responsible for. Initially, the investigation was limited to the period of Otar Kvalidze, and later, on that of Temeraz Janashia, the prosecutor's office declared the amount of 8.9 million Georgian lari as being embezzled, and together with the third president, it was only Janashia who was charged. Basically, I have been retired since February 2013, thanks to the new government for taking care of keeping me busy. I have had to go to court at least twice a month since then. What choice have I? That's all that's left for me. For six years, the general has been looking for answers to his questions. Why is he accused of performing his professional duties? Why was he the only one to be charged in August 2014? Where is the embezzlement? Every time I go there, I wonder what else the prosecutors will come up with. Will they miss the next court session? Will they bring a new witness? What else will they invent? And so on. They are just tools of political persecution. Here we are. Let's now go and attend a circus show. Judge Badri Kochalama Zashvili, according to the lawyers, is under duress from the prosecutor's office, and therefore he acts as being part of the prosecution. We have no personal bias toward this judge when we demand his challenge. This is due to the position repeatedly demonstrated by the judge during the trial. His position is manifested in his statements in his decisions to reject various defense motions. His position can be judged by his connivance at various illegal actions of the prosecutor's office during the trial. The defendant's lawyers have repeatedly filed petitions for the disqualification of the judge. One challenge was filed because a judge was directly involved in another trial in which another judge of the same court found the third president guilty for having the sentences of more than 200 prisoners. However, the constitutional powers of the president to grant pardons or reduce the terms of imprisonment of those sentenced are not limited by law. For any objective lawyer, this decision of a judge is unconstitutional and is an example of politicized justice. Geronti Alania, convicted in the Gergliani case, had the remaining jail term halved by the president's decree of 24th November 2008. However, he was not freed from imprisonment. Geronti Alania was released on parole personally by you, Your Honor, by your decree of 5th September 2009. In other words, according to the position of the prosecutor's office, there is Mikhail Saakashvili, who allegedly illegally reduced the term of Alania's imprisonment. And there is Judge Badri Kochalama Zashwili, who ruled to release this prisoner. Both the third president and Kochalama Zashwili, from the point of view of the authorities, are accomplices in one criminal act. I have a question. Why, despite the publicly stated position of the prosecutor, he has no questions to you? If having the remaining term of punishment for those convicted in the Gergliani case is a crime, then why did your decision of parole of the convicted in the Gergliani case not receive a legal assessment by the prosecutor's office? In order to not undermine the image of the court, in order to once again prove to the public that there can be an objective trial in Georgia, I urge you to withdraw from this case. Nothing personal, absolutely. I understand it too, Mr. Tamer, that I am in a poor situation in this regard. No matter what my decision is, there will still be question marks, and I accept this. However, it is the duty of the judge to provide an impartial and fair consideration of the case.
You, Your Honor, are motivated and you are following in the footsteps of the prosecutors. That's what your task is. You expelled the lawyer Basilaya. The prosecutors interrupted the course of the witness interview 50 times and made pointless protests. And you did not even stop it. That's what your task is, Your Honor. By the way, the lawyer Basilaya was wrong. We transcribed the recording of this session. The defense interrogated an important witness for one hour and 50 minutes. And the judge and prosecutors interrupted the lawyer and the witness not 50 times, but exactly 90 times. They did so in concert whenever the witness's answers contradicted the prosecution's account. This court session has become a symbol of the whole process, where not only the president and the general, but also one of the most important periods of the recent history of Georgia were on trial. I'm stuck with Samartal Tanaranairi Kaushiriaraks, Es Aris Imguari Sakme Romeli. This case has nothing to do with justice. This is the case that cannot exist in a democratic country and cannot exist in a free political space where there is no pressure on certain individuals. In this letter, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that at one of the trials against the third president of Georgia, Mikhail Saakashvili, which is popularly dubbed as the trial of jackets and wreaths, the expenses incurred during the official visit to your country are considered embezzlement of the budget. This is how letters to the heads of diplomatic missions to Georgia begin. The letter addressed to the Polish ambassador is especially extensive, as the indictment includes all expenses related to the visits to Poland for the entire period contested by the prosecutor's office. December 2012, the third president of Georgia held a meeting with President Bronislaw Komorowski in Warsaw. Then he took part in a conference dedicated to the memory of Grigol Pratze. He also attended a funeral to commemorate the victims of the Auschwitz concentration camp. Grigol Peradze was a prominent Georgian figure, one of the greatest Georgians, not only a clergyman, but also one of the national heroes of our country. He showed us once and for all that Georgia is not an insignificant country, that Georgia holds an important place in the entire region, both in Europe and in the Middle East. The Georgian delegation visited the University of Warsaw, here, the president laid a wreath at the memorial plaque of the professors killed together with Grigol Pratze by the Nazis. Saakashvili also honored the Georgian officers who were shot at Katyn. Later, he arrived in Krakow with the first lady of Georgia, Sandra Rolofs, to visit the Wawel Castle, where Lech and Maria Kaczynski were buried. Expenses borne during this official visit are also included as material evidence in the indictment of the so-called embezzlement. Those are the cost of a wreath laid at the memorial to the victims of Nazism, the cost of the wreath laid at the graves of Lech and Maria Kaczynski, as well as the cost of the stay of the state airplane crew in a hotel in Warsaw. I think this is inconceivable. It is hard to believe that there can be a dispute over this. Those are the costs that are necessary and important. Such costs are borne in all states of the world. We all know that the Ukraine will be the next. It is important to uphold the values which Europe stands on, and if these values are worth something, Europe must defend them, let Kaczynski said in Tbilisi on 12 August 2008. In Georgia, only two foreigners were awarded the title of the national hero. Both names are found in the indictment of the case of jackets and wreaths. Yet we will first remember let Kaczynski. Upon his initiative, 300 children displaced from the Trenwali region, a result of the Russian occupation, were taken to Poland for rehabilitation in September 2008.
From the post-war stressful situation that affected us so badly every day, we moved to a completely different space, which, to be honest, helped us forget the events that had recently unfolded around us. It was a very interesting environment. In Poland, we arrived at a hotel that had all kinds of entertainment facilities for children. Everything was absolutely free. We went on different tours. We went sightseeing in the city. That period is the best memory for me. At the farewell event, we met the First Lady. She gave us some presents that I still keep, a memory card, a cup, etc. I kept those for myself. Unfortunately, I do not have the photos. I was very happy during that trip. I remember this well. In 2011, the First Lady of Georgia, Sandra Roloffs, paid a working visit to Warsaw. She held important meetings, as well as the presentation of the Polish version of her book, The Story of an Idealist, dedicated to the memory of Maria Kaczynska. In an interview with Polish television, Roloffs recalled the war, the support from Poland and the Kaczynski family, hosting of IDP children in Poland, the hospitality expenses of that visit are also included in the indictment, along with the cost of souvenirs and presents for the Polish hosts of the IDP children. The prosecutor's office is trying to portray that Mikhail Saakashvili had a hedonistic gravitation towards luxury, and the pro-government media in Georgia and the Russian propaganda took up this version of the Georgian prosecutor's office. The statements by the prosecutor, Nateas Angelashvili, were eagerly quoted by Putin's propaganda media in the shows staged against Mikhail Saakashvili. If we rely on the prosecution's statements, he was not spending money on politics. He was spending money on women? Yes, yes. These are just the official facts. On August 10th, the prosecutor's office of Georgia made a statement. Whatever was happening in these shows is also going on in the hall of the Tbilisi City Court. The lead prosecutor in charge of the case, in all seriousness, told the court that she would name, I quote, women of loose morals on whom the budget money was spent. Why did you mention ladies of loose moral? On what basis? You can attend the forthcoming session and you will surely find out. Can you name these ladies of loose morals? Yes, yes, by their first names and their last names, and from which countries they came. These ladies were foreigners. I cannot remember which country they were from. A mother and her daughter. They were guests of the president, and the president invited them for a bicycle ride in Cajeti either to Ilya Lake or Quarelli Lake. The guest did not have suitable shoes, and it was decided to buy her sneakers. We bought them at a Nike shop and handed them to the guest. At the prosecutor's office, I was asked who these ladies were. I told them that they were the president's guests. They asked me if they were ladies of loose morals. Madam Natia, you were going to name these ladies of loose morals. When are you going to do that? Prosecutor Sanchilashvili left the case. She was promoted before she fulfilled her promise. There is no mentioning of anything like this in the criminal case. However, the prosecutors actively used this line during the entire process, and this served only one purpose to convince the public that Mikhail Saakashvili used the state funds for such services. PR is the main thing in this case. The prosecutors of the jackets and wreaths can argue that they do not contest the expenses related to official visits. In reality, the case includes the cost of all official visits that Mikhail Saakashvili and Sandra Roloffs had during the contested period from 2009 to 2013. The state prosecution allegedly contests only those expenses that were incurred for the president, served his comfort, and did not serve the purposes of the special state security service. Mr. George, how could the expenses borne during official visits be expenses for personal comfort? There are a lot of official visits. I saw them in the case. There are a lot of expenses of the members of the delegations. How is all that attributed to spending on the comfort of the president? Moreover, when those are official visits, 
These were not official visits. No, they were. Madam Ketty, please tell me. There are expenses related to official visits, aren't there? Why are you lying that they are not official? Putin's long-term strategic goal is to create a sphere of Russian dominance and hegemony in the vast area the Soviet Union and the Tsars once ruled. If he succeeds in bringing down the most independent and pro-Western leader in the former Soviet space outside the Baltics, he will have gone a long way toward his goal. In this article published in the Washington Post in 2006, Richard Holbrook wrote, The European Union and the United States must make the continued freedom and independence of Georgia a test case of the Western relationship with Russia. I wrote a year ago that the Russians were going to try to provoke <laughs> Holbrook arrived and checked into the Hotel Kopala, which in those days, like the rest of Georgia, was under the constant threat of bombing. From there, he called all TV channels worldwide and went live. This man played a crucial role in saving the statehood of Georgia and saving the city of Tbilisi. He is simply one of the giants of American foreign policy. Richard Holbrook was called a giant of American diplomacy by U.S. President Barack Obama. Till the last moment, he was the U.S. Special Envoy to Afghanistan and Pakistan. For his support of our freedom, Saakashvili awarded Holbrook the Order of St. George's Order the Victorious, but only posthumously. As a sign of gratitude, one of the streets in Tbilisi is named after Richard Holbrook. According to my letter addressed to the U.S. Ambassador to Georgia, the Ivanishvili regime is accusing Saakashvili of representation expenses related to his official visit to the United States in 2011. During this visit, the third president of Georgia took part in an event dedicated to the memory of Richard Holbrook. Later, there was a face-to-face -face meeting with the president, Barack Obama. Saakashvili also met with many other key U.S. figures, including Senators Richard Lugar and Carl Levin. The indictment contains, as the so-called evidence of crime, expenses related to this official visit, including the cost of transportation, meals, medicines, and so on. This document is also from the indictment. It summarizes the cost of the dinner held in January 2011 in honor of Senator Joseph Lieberman in Washington, D.C. The indictment includes the expenses related to the award ceremony of Senator Lieberman. Do you know that? Do you know who Senator Lieberman is? You have expenses related to the award included as part of the embezzlement. In August 2008, Joseph Lieberman arrived in Tbilisi together with Lindsey Graham. After the ceasefire, together with John McCain, he lobbied for the idea of providing Georgia with defense weapons, for peace, not for war. There is a power that wants good in the world. This power is here, and you are one of its leaders. This is what Saakashvili said at a ceremony awarding Senator Lieberman. The American press provided extensive coverage of the event at the Georgetown Club. The cost of the dinner at the club is also included in the jackets and wreaths indictment. I attended the dinner held in connection to the award ceremony, and I think it was one of the opportunities where we were able to express our gratitude to our friends. Those costs were undoubtedly an investment in the development of a strategic partnership between us and the United States. Dinner aside, this event was an important investment in building relationships with these people. Along with Senator Lieberman, this dinner was attended by people who shaped the U.S. foreign policy. They still serve in either Congress or in various important positions, and their support has helped Georgia in all crisis situations and will continue to do so in the future. Politically biased judges and the judiciary 
means that the rights of none of us are protected. We've been persecuted for five years. The third president of Georgia is in exile. Do not be under the illusion that you can bring Mikhail Saakashvili here and put him in jail. You should not think that protecting the third president of Georgia is not our and everyone's duty. Don't you dare. You wouldn't dare. The 2008 war did not start on August 7th, and it did not end on August 12th. It was one of the hot phases of the hybrid war unleashed by Russia against Georgia, which continues to this day. These threats are not only military, there's also a penetration of Russian special services into various institutions in Georgia. There are threats, economic, financial, and anti-Georgian propaganda. The first half of 2009 was particularly difficult. A new administration was being formed in the United States. It could not be ruled out that Russia would consider this period favorable for its goals. Russia did not comply with the ceasefire agreement. It drastically increased the number of troops in the occupied territories and started very dangerous maneuvers in the Black Sea. Some of the friends of our country even named a possible date for the resumption of hostilities. In an interview given to Radio Liberty, the former head of the mission of the European Commission in Georgia, Dennis Corboy, did not rule out the possibility of a new attack in July 2009. When it suits their agenda, but probably in the later, latter part of the summer of this year. The International Crisis Group also wrote about the high risk of new provocations from Russia. At that time, it was decided to classify unforeseen representation expenses of the president. Those were related to the person under protection, his place of residence, his movements, his stay abroad, the identity of his guests. It was related to everyday activities, which was important intelligence for a hostile country or terrorist group. Therefore, this type of information could only be obtained from the Special State Security Service. We changed the way we traveled. Movement did not look like escort. Routes were changing. There were unexpected changes. Everything related to the president was secret. What he ate, what he drank, who he met. When food-related security measures were further tightened, the Special Security Service purchased special equipment to ensure maximum food safety. In many countries in crisis situations, especially when the country is in a state of war, it is common practice to keep this kind of information classified. Our task in the period following the hot phase of the war was to draw as much attention to Georgia as possible, to involve as many of our partners as possible in ensuring the security of Georgia and to stay in the international community. Hence, the range of representation expenses was much wider than it would be in a normal settled situation. Why don't you take into account the testimony of the witnesses who tell you that the expenses were classified for security reasons? Because I do not agree. The prosecutors stubbornly insist that the classification of President Saakashvili's representation expenses was illegal since the funds were not spent on security but were misused for entertainment and leisure. They constantly peddle the story of a masseuse. It was the publicity of this woman's visit and a strong reaction from the public that led to the subsequent illegal classification of such expenses as secret. And that is at the time when the costs of a masseuse do not figure into the indictment at all. It's simply a part of a PR campaign. November 2012. Upon the invitation from the Secretary General of NATO, President Saakashvili visited Prague. He took part in the 58th session of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. 
In his speech, he reaffirmed Georgia's goal to become a member of NATO and the European Union. The representation expenses of this official visit, transportation, meals, communication, accommodation for the state airplane crew members are also included in the indictment. Our idealistic team. In the indictment, we found expenses incurred during an official visit to the United States in March 2011, during which President Saakashvili held talks with Donald Trump and his company. As a result, a preliminary agreement was signed for the construction of a Trump Tower in Batumi. The prosecutor's office contests the cost of the dinner held during these talks. A room was reserved for President Saakashvili at the Donald Trump Hotel. Even renting a bicycle for the President of Georgia at the Trump Tower appears in the indictment. A major part of the expenses listed in the case of jackets and wreaths are the aforementioned type of expenses which are never mentioned by the prosecutors and the general is accused of obeying the orders of the Supreme Commander-in-Chief. Those orders were the subject of a study by the Security Council, where they underwent legal examination and then were published in the Legislative Bulletin. Execution was mandatory upon the institutions mentioned in those orders. The Special State Security Service was among those. Presidential decrees on secret expenses were primarily executed by the Finance Ministry through allocation of funds. The expenses were paid by the Special State Security Service from the Reserve Fund and not from the budget of the named service. In accordance with those decrees, four different ministers allocated those funds. The funds were accompanied by the list of corresponding categories of expenses for which they were intended to be spent. This list was used as a guide for expenses by Otar Kualidza before me during my office by me, Temeraz Janashia, and then by Anzor Chubinitsa after me. Therefore, it would be absurd to claim that the Special State Security Service, or a head of the service, embezzled the budget funds. <laughs> Nevertheless, an expert of the audit service, who is the main witness of the prosecution, on the basis of incomplete documentation, provided to him by the counterintelligence service, concluded the presence of inappropriate spending in his report. As he was interviewed by the court, the expert failed to substantiate the basis of upon which data he made such a conclusion. In the case of General Janashia, there are no signs of criminal offense in his actions, and we will substantiate this statement legally, despite the opinion of our court friend. And finally, a significant part of the documents presented in the indictment was signed by Otar Kulidza. If Janashia was charged in 2014, they thought about Kulidza only five years later. The lawsuit against him was initiated in the spring of 2019. This trial was processed at lightning speed. Immediately, Kulidza pled guilty, and it ended in a plea bargain. Kulidza was punished to whitewash our selective justice. He pled guilty in Teralia for purchasing these jackets. In September 2012, U.S. Senators Lindsey Graham, Joseph Lieberman, and John McCain arrived in Batumi. The then Minister of Education, Katia Dekanoitza, presented the project of Batumi Technological University to the guests. The president invited the senators to the restaurant Marseille. The meeting was attended by President Saakashvili and Senators McCain, Lieberman and Graham. The topics of discussion were related to Georgia's integration into NATO and the U.S. support for Georgia. We also discussed new education projects about how to deploy a wide front of the policy of non-recognition, which was then acutely on the agenda 
and the senators made active efforts in this direction. The dinner was modest. Georgian wine was served. I met John McCain several times. He never hid his admiration for Georgian wine. I would like to present Senator McCain with a medal and order and award him the title of National Hero of Georgia. The cost of inviting the U.S. and Georgian national hero John McCain, together with Senators Lieberman and Graham to the restaurant, is also in the indictment. We started it like two years ago, and you know, we just give them pocket money. Like... The prosecutor's office didn't overlook the visit of the U.S. Secretary of State to Batumi either. Well, this is like a perfect night. The indictment indicates the cost of treating Hillary Clinton to Georgian tea and mineral water at the Batumi Piazza Square, and not only at the Piazza. The hopes and to the great friendship between the United States and Georgia. The president often took guests to Kacheti region as well. In November 2012, 75 lari paid for boiled beef in the Kudigora restaurant near Lake Ilia, is a part of the embezzled 8.9 million Georgian lari. On that day, the president was hosting the mayor of Palermo in Kvareli. This is the cost of the visit of the Ukrainian president, Viktor Yushchenko, to the sulfur baths in Tbilisi. This is also from the indictment. And here is a bill from a restaurant in Anaklia, where in the summer of 2012, Saakashvili hosted the president of Lithuania, Valdas Adamkus. On this day, the square in Anaklia was named after President Adamkus. Our family is socially unprotected. Sandra helped my mother because my mother is diabetic. She helped her by purchasing medicines. Back in the past, this girl was selected for an exchange program of the First Lady of Georgia and the First Lady of Azerbaijan. Georgian children were guests of the First Lady of Azerbaijan in Baku, and Azerbaijani children, who had no parents, were received in Tbilisi by the First Lady of Georgia, Sandra Roloffs. All the expenses related to the visit of the Azerbaijani children, excursions, amusement park, sweets, lemonade, are listed in the indictment. The personal archive of Sandra Roloffs contains information about charity events held during the period contested by the prosecutor's office. The indictment includes everything, organizing excursions for school teachers and students from different parts of Georgia, gifts for socially vulnerable families, children's books, fairy tales, toys, medicines, For example, I remember presenting the First Lady of Armenia with a Georgian tablecloth with dark blue ornaments. The cost of souvenirs taken to Yerevan also appears in the indictment. The cost of a bouquet sent to Laura Bush, the cost of a souvenir handed to Hillary Clinton, and so on and so on. There were many different initiatives related to healthcare in Georgia, such as the prevention and treatment of tuberculosis and many other diseases. It is Sandra Roloff's personal merit that these programs have started and continue to work today. Under the leadership of Sandra Roloffs, Georgia attracted over $100 million in grants to fight infectious diseases, not to mention other areas of health care. She never spoke about this publicly herself. All the expenses incurred for the First Lady's working visits, during which the assistance to Georgia in the field of health care was agreed, are included in the indictment of the Jackets and Wreaths case. Roloff's letters to diplomatic missions describing the ongoing political persecution. Why did the president rent a bicycle during an official visit? Should he have bought souvenirs and gifts for the guests? One would not have been surprised to hear such questions from the media. However, in Georgia, these questions are discussed in courts during the trial of the third president of the country. I think the above facts and explanations cast light on the fact that in today's Georgia, justice is used as a tool to discredit the third president 
Mikhail Saakashvili. Due to the ongoing prosecution, the third president of Georgia is forced to live in exile. I believe that fighting today's political persecution and selective justice is a service to the country. If I cannot make it to the end, at least it will be easier for the people affected by selective justice and political persecution to follow in my footsteps. As for my future, as far as I look ahead, I will serve this country and this state. As soon as I'm needed, I will be there. For the seventh year in a row, General Tamaraz Janashia has been unjustly persecuted for fulfilling the orders of the country's supreme commander. The third president of Georgia, Mikhail Saakashvili, was expelled from his country, among other reasons, for the case of jackets and wreaths described in this film. In August 2008, Putin was faced with the task of overthrowing Saakashvili. As we can see, the regime of the oligarch Ivanishvili persecutes Saakashvili for all his presidential activities, which were aimed at European integration, strengthening security, and ensuring non-recognition of Abkhazia and the South Ossetia following Russia's large-scale armed aggression against Georgia. Persecution of Saakashvili is the realization of Putin's dream with the help of the so-called Georgian dream. The authors of the film, Eka Tsamalashvili, Georgi Kanturia, 